Next tonight, Charlene hunter Gold talks with award-winning author Toni Morrison about her highly acclaimed novel, Beloved. As one of America's most formidable women of letters, Toni Morrison always gets a lot of attention when a novel of hers is published. Her latest, Beloved, came out in September and is already in its third printing. It's fast moving to the top of the bestseller list, following the pattern of Morrison's four other novels published over the last 16 years, The Bluest Eye, Sula, Song of Solomon, and Tar Baby. When Tar Baby was published in 1981, Morrison's stature in the world of fiction earned her a Newsweek cover story. Beloved is the second Morrison novel to become a Book of the Month Club main selection. Beloved is the story of a runaway slave, Setha, who tries to kill her children rather than see them return to slavery. She succeeds in killing only one, a daughter named Beloved. The story unfolds around the return of Beloved's angry ghost. She moves into the house with her mother and sister, Denver. Here, Morrison reads from a passage that illuminates Denver's view of the murder and Setha's need to make Beloved's ghost understand it. Setha was trying to make up for the handsaw. Beloved was making her pay for it. But there would never be an end to that. And seeing her mother diminished, shamed and infuriated her. Yet she knew Setha's greatest fear was the same one Denver had in the beginning, that Beloved might leave, that before Setha could make her understand what it meant, what it took to drag the teeth of that saw under the little chin, to feel the baby blood pump like oil in her hands, to hold her face so her head would stay on, to squeeze her so she could absorb still the death spasms that shot through that adored body plump, and sweet with life, Beloved might leave, leave before Setha could make her realize that worse than that, far worse, was what baby Suggs died of, what Ella knew, what Stamp saw, and what made Paul D. tremble, that anybody white could take your whole self for anything that came to mind, not just work, kill, or maim you, but dirty you, dirty you so bad you couldn't like yourself anymore. Dirty you so bad, you forgot who you were and couldn't think it up. And though she and the others lived through and got over it, she could never let it happen to her own. The best thing she was was her children. Whites might dirty her all right, but not her best thing, her beautiful, magical best thing, the part of her that was clean. Toni Morrison, what inspired this theme? I read an article in a 19th century newspaper about a woman whose name was Margaret Garner, who had indeed killed or tried her children. She was a fugitive slave, and um, rather than have them go back, she decided to take them all into a permanent place of oblivion, and it was... Uh, an article that stayed with me for a long, long time and seemed to have in it an extraordinary uh, idea that was worthy of a novel, which was this compulsion to nurture, this ferocity that a woman has to be responsible for her children, and at the same time, the kind of tensions that exist in trying to be a separate, complete individual. You've said that uh, she has no, she had no right to do it, but I would have done the same thing. I mean, it me was that. the right thing to do, but she had no right to do it. I think I felt the the claims. You see, those women were not parents. They could have. They were they, people insisted that they have children. But they could not be mothers because they had nothing to say about the future of those children, where they went. They could make no decisions. They frequently couldn't even name them. So that they were denied humanity in a number of ways. But they were denied uh, that role, which is um, early, uh, I mean, has nothing to do with history. It's what women do. And so she claimed something 
that she had no right to claim, which was the property of her children, and claimed it so finally that she decided that she could not only dictate their lives, but end them. And when one knows what the life, what their future would be, her decision is not that difficult to understand. You, you've talked about previous accounts of slavery being simplistic and, and not probing the interior being of, of the characters. Is this, how, how difficult was it for you to probe the interior being of characters, albeit black, still from a long, long time ago? Exactly. Well, my disappointment in some of the accounts uh, was based on the fact that this is so large, you see. And then the big problem is that slavery is so intricate, so immense, and so long, and so unprecedented, that you can let slavery be the story, the plot. And we know where that story is, and it is predictable. And then you do the worst thing, which is you de... You, the center of it becomes the institution and not the people. So if you focus on the characters and their interior life, it's like putting the authority back into the hands of the slave rather than the slaveholder. What is the rationale for the ghost? <laughs> First of all, I really wanted her past, her memories, her haunting memories, not to be abstract. I wanted her to actually sit down at the table with the thing she's been trying to avoid and explain away, which is this past, this terrible thing that happened, to confront it as a way of saying that's what the past is. It's a living thing. There's this relationship between ourselves and our personal history and our racial history and our national history that sometimes gets made, you know, sort of distant. But if you make it into a person, then it's inescapable to confrontation. The other was that it was part of the milieu of black people to think in terms of a very intimate relationship between the living and the dead. They didn't have that, you know, sort of uh, modern dismissal. They didn't dismiss those things. This book, Beloved, has, has received almost uh, no uh, critical um, reviews. I mean, just total acclaim. But one of the things that critics have said, both about this book and the character of Sethe and other uh, works of yours is that you draw characters that are larger than life. Does that disturb you or is that even a criticism as far as you're concerned? It used to disturb me, but I realized that what they are saying is that life is small. My characters are not bigger than life. They are, in fact, as big as life. And life is really very big. We tend to cut it down these days, smaller and smaller and smaller, to make it fit. I don't know what, a headline or a room. Do you, you think that modern readers have a diminished view of life? The readers don't, but the writers are making it smaller and smaller. Why? Television. Maybe so. We've been cut down to screen size and to short articles. Dwelling in the life of a complicated person over a complicated period in fiction is not in vogue. It, this, it's shorter, it's smaller, it's a narrower geography. One can do it in history and biography, but not in contemporary life. You said many years ago, I, well not many years ago, in, back in the 70s, that you were an editor at that time at Random House, and you were saying that you wanted to participate in developing a canon of black work beyond black self-flagellation, the kind of entertainment that you felt was being encouraged among black writers by white editors or the white society. Did you succeed in particular, and has the publishing world succeeded in general in having a better balance of work? From a little. There has been, there's still resistance because the fix on who that reader is hasn't changed a great deal. Uh, the reader is a, somebody between 40 and 60 who's white and lives, you know, in a suburb near a big city. There's sort of classic profiles of who buys books. But something happened in the meantime, and a huge readership emerged 
black and white and female, which made a difference in what was published. There, when I mentioned the self-flagellation, I was particularly aware of some titles in particular, but more importantly, the eagerness with which publishers and uh, people in the book industry were interested in books by black people that said, let me, tell me how angry you are. Let me see your anger. Tell us how terrible it has been for you. And so there was a en sly encouragement to sort of expose the horrors of being the victim, which some people played into. But it was like feeding the vampire with one's own blood instead of describing you know, a complicated, extraordinary uh, survival life, which doesn't mean you wipe the slate clean and all the black people are heroic and there was a mood of that. But you have some, what I regard as some of the most complicated, interesting, mysterious people in the world, a whole group of them. And they need to be revealed for what that life is, not simply to reveal and educate or even play into the hands of the yearning, what used to be a yearning for the guilt, expressions of guilt among white people. And that's what I meant. Uh, by that uh, sort of large book, and I wanted that to change. And many black women writers have succeeded along those lines because there was this active, growing readership out there who was just desperately hungry to see themselves such a stage for a change. What happens as a Toni Morrison who has been responsible for introducing so many new voices into American fiction, letters, as you move farther and farther away from your editing responsibility because of the success of your mm -hmm. own publishing, um, who fills that void? And what does that do, how, do, how does that make you feel? I mean, in a way, you're abandoning your children. <laughs> it's true, I am abandoning them as an editor, but I am convinced that the more I am well-known, the better known I am, the easier it is for other writers to come along. If I till that soil myself in publicity, traveling around Europe, selling books, lecturing, what have you, then all of the younger people who won't have to break down those same doors, they'll be open. They will write infinitely better than I do. They will write of all sorts of things that no one writer can ever touch. They will be stronger and they will be delicious to read. But part of that availability and accessibility is because six or seven black women writers, among whom I am one, have already been there and tilled the soil. <laughs>